Hey y'all, it's Alexis from Ask Alexis here, and we have an amazing guest today. This is Cheryl Leong, conscious leadership coach and therapist, but I just want y'all to know, I call Cheryl Auntie Cheryl because Cheryl be coming with the the, the heat, okay? She come with the, the 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 psychological heat and the the like ironic, funny, quippy. Like, wait a minute, I didn't I don't I didn't think I was supposed to be laughing right now. Heat, um, and don't and I want you to subscribe to Cheryl's channel too because we believe in elevating like minded people. Hold on one second, one two three. Alrighty, sorry about that, y'all. Um, but Cheryl and I are, oh, subscribe to Cheryl's channel, which is Leading with Consciousness. And while you're at it, subscribe to this one. Um, and I'll put the link in the descriptions for Cheryl's uh, channel because we're really, well, the thing I love about Cheryl is that we are both called from a deep intrinsic place to create a shared and inclusive future and are doing this work actively in our lives. Um, so Cheryl and I are going to talk to you about what it's like to be us, a black woman yeah. and a Singaporean woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Cheryl, where would you like to start? Well, one, I love your hashtag shared future or bust. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's the commitment. Yeah. And, uh, so, so these conversations are adding to that whole movement. Um, and I think when I first talked to you, so many of like your ideas, like almost like fit in with mine almost immediately, including your ideas about the ice age or scarcity. And so you mean, I mean your it was just, ideas I was impressed by in my basic understanding. <laughs> well, I have basic understanding too, but, but it just seemed like it all fit. And so, um, anyway, so starting with just I really appreciate your hashtag. Thank you. Thank you. I um, appreciate your appreciation. And I, it is for me a commitment of how I want to live my life because I am a conscious person, spiritual being, having a Black human experience, blah, 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 blah. But it is like, all right, so the thing I can do is choose how I live. And I'm going to choose to be working towards the kind of future that makes me feel safe. And the more I am on my journey of self-awareness, the more I recognize that my safety needs to be in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Cheryl, how about we start with you telling us a bit of your story so then we can go from there. Sure. Okay. So I am a Singaporean immigrant. Uh, moved to the United States, I think in 1995, but since then have moved back and forth, undecided about where I should be um, for civil liberties and some political reasons, um, some political good trouble that I got into, I ended up saying, okay, I really need to think about moving here permanently. Uh, was on a visa for many, many years, finally met my wife, and then marriage equality happened. So I got my green card in 2014. Yay. Here's my protein like, shake here. Like, hip rolls. Okay, here bear hip rolls. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know where baby cheer went, but baby cheer is <laughs> supposed to hip roll too, wherever they are. Oh, well. <laughs> so, uh, and then a couple of years later, I had a baby with my wife. We have what's called a reciprocal IVF baby, which okay. means my egg, her womb, and a and a petri dish somewhere in the lab, and a doctor um, wow. created so this and, child. I <laughs> like that though. So uh, I'm sorry. I'm not saying that I am the barometer for everything that the world is well versed on. How, but that you to me you can't just explain that process and, and keep going so fast that's one of those like wait a minute we have to pause just a little bit <laughs> um so what I think is I like that because it is still to it feels very symbolic of a joint union 
mm-hmm. and co-creation of life. Mm-hmm. And so when I think of things that are used to like uh, be oppressive to queer people, it is it, it like it's like it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and blah blah blah. <laughs> Like, and then they use like, well, how, if it wasn't right, how come that's the only way you could have a baby? And it's kind of <laughs> like, no, but it's not the only way. And it is a, still a co-creation. Mm-hmm. Like there is still a co-creation and a union. And that like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, and and lots of gratitude to the, to the sperm donor who is, who seems to be red or light brown haired Irish. We got the photo and he had a, like a huge beard. So I often joke that it's, it's a, it's a handsome leprechaun kind of guy, but you know, so, and I see some of that in, in my child, but um, you know, it, it is us. Interesting uh, combination, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, is there, did you know that he was a redhead? Re- yeah, we go, we got the photo and and a little bit about the background in, in in a menu in the menu of like I call it this the male seed menu. It was like we got like a menu and so put that together. Did um did you? Sorry, I'm a little distracted by my dog. <laughs> um, did you? Is there a reason that you picked a redhead Irish man? Did you know, you okay, this is gonna say this is I'm gonna express my queerness a little bit here. Uh, or a lot here. So it's really strange, the idea of male seed touching my egg, right? It's, I mean, the whole idea of it, and then it's going to happen on a dish in a lab. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, I, it feels, you know, it's not the way that I would immediately think of making a baby. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm just like, oh, which seed is is worthy of my little egg here? <laughs> so, you know, there was like, and so I had to be really careful. I'm like, oh, so finally, I, I saw this photo and my wife like this photo, and we read the background. Um, and so I, I think it was something about his background, and he was kind of a sciencey kind of guy from the background. And my wife is kind of sciencey. I'm not the sciencey person, but it's sort of like, seemed like if I were a hetero person, a hetero cis person, seems like this would be the kind of person that I would be attracted to. <laughs> So then I'm like, oh, okay, I think I think on a dish outside of my body, this would happen really well. <laughs> so that's sort of the thinking around it. That's my, my queer mind being manifested in this process. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh at your lived experience, but your laugh is a whole it's like wow. Um <laughs> I don't know that I was ready for this. <laughs> Well, but you know, I follow it. Like I see the logic and I see the like, okay, well, if we're going to be like personality traits that I can bond and identify with, like I'm Mm -hmm. already attracted to a sciencey person. This is a sciencey person. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, allyship educator, love the fact that you still chose diversity. Yeah, like, you, like it was. It mm-hmm. had nothing to do with your baby being a complete reflection of the two of you. It was much more about uh, human dynamics and relationship. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we know how important, like how that's actually the sauce of life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so time back into your story. Now that we take the, the the <laughs> rabbit hole detour of uh, petri dish. Uh, sperm selection and baby creation. Yeah. And so, uh, and then here I am. I, I've been a therapist and a coach for 20 years, probably 70% therapist, 30% coach. I'm shifting towards doing more coaching with a D, diversity, equity, inclusion focus. So that's where I am in my life and career. Oh, I have a question. Um, mm-hmm. Why, what makes you want to shift? And when you say, I think it would be really good for the listeners to hear this uh, uh, perspective. When you say you're probably 70% coach, 30% therapist, and you're switching more into the coaching realm, what do you see as the difference between the two? And then what makes you, why are you transitioning? Yeah, so I'm 70% therapist, 30% coach, have been. Apologies. uh, No no problem. Um, I think I've been a therapist since 
my, I started my therapy training, um, like right after college and I was a little younger. I was 20 when I graduated college. And so jumping right into the, the training and all that, I mean, working with suicidal people at 20, you know, I, I think it's been a long road. I'm 42 now. So I think I'm, I've, I'm ready for a change. You know, I, I trauma, trauma stories, seven, eight hours a day. Um, so I'm ready. It's, it will make and, me and a I, bear. Hmm? That oh, was, that's a sweet bear. <laughs> that was grumpy bear. It would make me a grumpy bear to, to like to be 20 and have that like that's the world being reflected back to you too. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I like being a coach in organizations because I, I feel like I get to work with systems. As a therapist, I worked with family systems, but I like kind of these broader community, you know, organizational systems a lot more. Now, for some reason, after becoming a parent, that that's been sort of the way that my mind and my heart has shifted. So that's where I am. So what makes you think that, so what do you think is the difference between coaching and therapy? Well, I think therapy is, is a licensed mental health profession. And, and that's a profession that traditionally has been born out of the medical field. And in the U.S., if you have a license, you you pretty much are, you know, it's within your scope to diagnose, assess, provide an intervention. So it's a very medical, kind of very medically based, um, even though a lot of therapists don't do that. They, they, they kind of look at the healing aspects more and, and dive into the unconscious mind and those kinds of things. Um, coaching, I think... Uh, stays away from that. It's very more positive strength focused. I'm not saying that therapists aren't, but it doesn't have all the medical stuff. And um, it's, it's, it's less restrictions as well, because it's not a licensed profession. So you get to be more creative without the boundaries. Um, and you get to work in organizations. So, so I, that's, that's what I like about it. So I, I'm going to add some of my opinion, but what I heard you say is that so therapists, I enjoy and appreciate the trained license, you know, you can diagnose, assess. Um, but what I, I enjoy that you said is like, so a lot of therapists don't do just that, even though it's more medically focused, they, uh, they get more into the healing aspect. So to me, it seems mm -hmm. like when you're in the practice of it, you value the healing aspect if you are connected to that as a purpose of your work. Mm -hmm. But then coaching, is more like, it's definitely not diagnosing, assessing and anything of that, but it's more, you have a goal. I'm gonna coach you with the skill set that I have and my ability to analyze and ask appropriate and relevant questions while being present uh, to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there's people like me who do that and cope with coaching and then they have their moonbeam. <laughs> that makes you a very unique gifted presence in our world <laughs> um which is still something i'm adjusting to real like because in my mind everybody has a moonbeam um because i did i had it all my life and didn't know it so like i feel like people just have it and don't know it um but we shall see um so what makes you want to be get more into coaching versus like since you've done therapy you've been a therapist for longer than you have been a coach, but you want to transition into coaching. Honestly, I think since 2016 and having a kid, the the things that hit my heart more tended to be larger systemic things. And so I've focused on individuals and couples, um, but I, I found my coaching work way more um, like the juice was there. I don't, I, I don't know. I, like my life juice tended to like, I, I looked forward to like the coaching things. I love healing. I love being a therapist, but something about seeing 2016 and seeing some of these individual problems, sort of like there's a hole in a tub. And I felt like as a therapist, I'm pouring water into the tub, but there's like this hole that keeps, so I'm like managing symptoms. I'm, I'm trying to help, you know, support the, the healing process for this client but there were these larger systemic things that were just overwhelming. Yeah. So, so those were the, those were the things that I, my, my heart's kind of shifted towards us. I want to work on these larger things as well. So that's where. Oh, I'm so torn. There's two roads I want to go down with these questions. <laughs> I don't know. 
Okay, so do you think that your perspective as an, a Singaporean immigrant, and what I mean is I've heard you mention that Singapore, would, like you, you are from post-colonial Singapore. So you have the mm -hmm. perspective of understanding how colonial systems, the like, the the darker side and then you come here and you can see this and you see the effects play out in people's individual lives so like did that is that do you think that that's what made you be able to see it because why are all therapists saying these things hmm. yeah i mean i i think there's a small tiny anti-oppression slash pro-liberation therapy movement a lot of it i've seen amongst my colleagues but it's been very small i agree um, I think maybe part of it was growing up Singaporean, you know, being the first generation, you know, colonial free, decol the first decolonized generation. Um, that was part of it. But also, I think coming from a government system that was born out of racial riots and, you know, racial integration programs were part of my upbringing um, and literally like affirmative action on a like government level was, was done like, you know, in every neighborhood, there was there was a certain ratio and percentage and um, all that done to overcome um, racial rioting in the 60s, because that's what happens when colonials leave. It's there's usually a mess, right? Uh, so I saw a lot of racial integration programs growing up and and what it meant to sit with people who are different from me. Um, the flag itself is five stars and a moon. The moon is um, from the Islamic culture and the five stars are from the Chinese culture because the riots were happening between the Chinese and, and the Malay Muslims. And so something about that kind of symbolism in, in the countries, you know, emerging um, from that time, I think maybe something about that also has made me sort of, I see a lot of integration and like, like, like for example, I grew up celebrating Deepavali the end of Ramadan, the Lunar New Year, and Christmas, and they're all official, you know, celebrations in the country. Um, but then I move here, and then I say it's a Lunar New Year, and I don't see a lot of, like, different people coming together around the Lunar New Year. It's just the Lunar New Year and four people who celebrate that. Um, <laughs> or Ramadan, I don't see integration as well. So I, I, I miss that, you know, I miss, I miss, I miss people being able to get together around these things. I will so. say this for Ramadan, if you move to Southeast Michigan, you can see that integration because oh, yeah. Southeast Michigan has in Dearborn, it is a, a huge Arab population. And most of the signs are in uh, English and Arabic people speak both. And, um, so like I've been to an Eid celebration and, and even though it was, uh, they were Bengali, but still, um, the, I don't mean to combine the two. I'm just saying it was still Eid. Um, <laughs> but it was, so like, we have that here with the Middle Eastern population, but mm -hmm. I have not, I'm not for, I didn't know about the Lunar New Year. Um, and so I know we're supposed to talk about what it's like to be <laughs> Asian and black, but I I have more questions, and we may just have to come back with another. Uh, sure, that's right. Thing. Because this post-colonial society and growing up with racial integration programs being a part of your life, that sounds like incredibly relevant information to creating a shared future. So, what was that like for you, and what like what is it like there now? Yeah, I mean, it became. Oh gosh, I'm going to be careful also because not everything I could say openly because it is a government system that censors a lot, uh, which that might be censored now. But what did I just say? But uh, I think, you know, I, I I think we were always at least growing up in the in the '80s reminded of there used to be violence, right? And so if you want harmony, um, then we've got to find a way to be together. So um so for example there were these street food food vendors that were all over the place they were all sort of asked to be together in a single space so in every single street food kind of center there would be a muslim stall a vegetarian buddhist stall an indian stall and um something european but that combination that ratio was fixed and so and and everybody there were little round tables 
So you couldn't like just sit by yourself. You had to sit with other people and you had to share food, you know, halal food, vegetarian food, all of that came together on the same table. And uh, we learned to just appreciate each other in, in sort of this forced, you know, kind of um, environment. Uh, so I'm not saying that racism disappeared, it didn't, you know, but we learned to kind of be with each other in this, in this sort of controlled way. And as well as in classrooms, um, out of 40 students in a classroom, you know, there was a specific ratio, um, at least in, in some schools at the time, you know, that, that, that was a big deal. So, yeah. How was that ratio determined? Um, based on the population. So if there is a 65, 70% Chinese, uh, I think 10% Muslim, Malay, and then like an, another 10% Indian, and then um, a ratio of people who are mixed. Uh, if you were white and Asian, you there was a specific racial category for you, Eurasian, and there was like, it's like, it's on your ID, you know? So, so that was part of the ratio as well. Um, and so it was, yeah, uh, it was a very unique controlled experiment. It's very controlled. <laughs> and so like with immediate, my immediate resistance is, all right, so it's so a population is determined, the ratio is determined by the population, but then we have gerrymandering and people afraid to take the census. So I, I only know how to process it through my US American mind. Right. It, so it's like, wait a minute. Oh, I don't want it to be just only determined because then they'll just erase us. It's like, I, um, but then I'll have another question about the food. Did it become like fusion food or was every food authentic to the culture? Yeah, food was, you could have it authentic. But I think naturally, even before um, colonialism, there was already fusion. Like I'm from a fusion culture, it's Peranakan, which is a Malay Chinese fusion um, from like the 1400s. So there was already, the food was already fusion. I think when the, the colonials came, maybe they brought butter and, and black pepper and like, you know, different things. Um, but there's always been fusion, even without colonialism, like it, it's been a natural thing. It became even more so. Um, with with the with the integration programs, I think, from my experience, <laughs> what do you think about people being able to hold on to their individual cultural identities? With like, what was it affected by being so exposed to others? Well, I think it was really huge. Like, you had to you you were you were sort of invited to be very proud of who you were. Like, you you know, you're Malay Muslim. You're you're Chinese Buddhist. You're an Indian Hindu, you're, you're a Eurasian person. So you're carrying, you know, maybe some Spanish influence or some, you know, English influence, like whatever it was, you, you got to be you, but you had to learn to be with others without question. Um, it's also illegal to say something racist. So that, that could, that's a criminal charge. If pot, like if someone reports you, it's, it's a criminal thing. So it's, it's a high, it was a highly controlled uh, situation. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can imagine that level of government handling and you know and mm -hmm. i've worked at a casino and so i have been under 24 hour surveillance and have received consequences for things i did where no one in the room was watching um like be on my cell phone i want to be very clear i did not steal or anything like that i was just <laughs> on my cell phone in the service bar when i wasn't supposed to be <laughs> um, but <laughs> we had all those kind of meticulous rules because service <laughs> was key uh, so the, like, I can imagine it from that perspective, but I cannot imagine it having like, well, I don't know. It's kind of, I don't know how different it feels to me than being like black in the U S America in the mm. sense of like the scrutiny and the constant, like under a gaze and figuring out how to find yourself and live your life while being under this gaze after a while, it just uh goes backward one two three we're gonna pause for the doorbell so okay i have the next question and within reason because i heard you you mention and i'm trying to be like put it in my mind of like censorship and things like that what was the good and the bad of it well for one being queer remained illegal 
because the oh. the I think the the British left it as a law, um, it's the same law that they left in India and in, in most of the colonies, and so um, that was heavily um, controlled, especially in the eighties. And and I have a, a a podcast about it on my YouTube if you're interested in if anybody out there is interested in um, an interview I did with someone who experienced that level of um, control. Um, and so I think there was some aspects where, you know, I think the idea of freedom, freedom of speech is really, even till now, I still find it strange, even though I've lived here for so long. I'm like, oh, wait, I could say that. Oh, I could, I could just say it out loud. I won't be thrown in jail. I won't, you know, no one will investigate me. The police won't come knocking on my door because I said something. Um, it, so, um, yeah, I think I think there are some civil liberties here in the U.S. that I really appreciate, and that's why I moved here. I mean, the, I, for the civil liberties, but I also see that they're constantly, um, it you know, people are at risk for losing them here all the time, and are still fighting for them. And everybody <laughs> doesn't have them. Yeah, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. everybody you still fighting for them. I'm sorry, people still fighting for them, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so then. There, so the bad was there was still no freedom to be yourself. In some you focus about how to get along with others. You could be yourself culturally. You just couldn't say stuff about the government openly. Um, so if and and uh, so for example, in in the interview I did with this with this friend of mine, she made a documentary. Um, saying that even though there are racial integration programs, um, racism still exists. So that that was so that got the that that documentary banned for twenty two years because that was expressed in that documentary. Um, you know, and and also it it was a it was a deep critique of how making queerness illegal. You know, the kind of suffering that emerged and why it forces people into immigration. Um, so that documentary was banned for 22 years and, you know, with no, nothing, right? So, so I think, I think that, that, that kind of stuff was really, really hard, um, especially when I came out and, you know, it became harder, but, um, th there's, there's definitely lots of negative that, and also a lot of positive that come with it. So it's sort of a mixed bag of everything. So that, I mean, my, one of my values is I'm against oppression, period. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't, you have to like everything. So like, I'm, I still, I believe in like individual collectivism and in that as long as you are not harming another, you are free to be your full expression of yourself. Um, I, it, it feels like a, this is, I mean, I guess it's not dissimilar, but if when I'm thinking of it and like trying to understand it with my logical mind, it feels like it would be crazy making to be queer and be it, like have like this idea of quote equality and, and, and like there's, you can't say anything negative about someone else and all of that be a, like a pillar of society and then I'm still being oppressed as myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I still don't get to have, and then you can't have any negative opinions about certain things. So there's no, you're, there's no way to express that frustration mm -hmm. of, of the way that that oppression is stored in the body. Um, mm -hmm. So when, what do you think then it takes to have a shared and inclusive society? Like what would this society, US America, need to do in order to be able to combine the civil liberties that attracted you and integrate uh, racially in a way that is a shared and inclusive future? Wow, that's such a long essay question. So Sorry. be prepared for a long one. Is it is it okay if I go dive in and really go for all the? You go right on ahead. We have nineteen minutes left before, so we just need to have take nine minutes if you want. <laughs> okay. Um, for one, 
there is a violent innocence in this country. When I say that, I mean a level of denial that causes violence, um, specifically Black and Indigenous lives, right? And so, uh, and queer lives. So I think unless there's a there's an, a beginning to awaken from this really violent innocence and really look ex observing history, like really owning and taking responsibility for history that, um, and how, and, and owning that colonialism is happening, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, that's where we can start talking about a shared future, like it's the history. Um, and then the second piece is the constitution is really cool, right? With, with all these freedoms and civil liberties, but if you've got a Congress and a, and a political system that is pretty much hijacked by really unethical profit-making, you've got crony capitalism involved in your government. So government isn't exactly clean here. I mean, that that's another issue. So how can you have the civil liberties that you want if you're, if, if um, you've got essentially legalized corruption, um, you know, so, so I, I think, I think these are the couple of pieces um, that I would even just start to talk about, you know, if we're talking about genuine civil liberties and a shared future. So, yeah. So the answer, what I heard was a whole lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> takes a whole lot of people making the commitment of a shared future for their lives um, and all hands on deck, doing what they can when they can, mm -hmm. consciously. Mm -hmm. um, so then let's, so I'm a spiritual being, you're a spiritual being. We have this deep inner knowledge of how things work. Let's kind of transition into the, the metaphysics of it. Sure. Let's visualize a shared and inclusive society. So we don't have to figure out how, because we get to dream and in dreams, possibilities are irrelevant. Um, so what would that look like for you, Cheryl? Oh, I hate to say Sesame Street, but it's a lot like Sesame Street. And, this uh, and the Care Bears. And the Care Bears, these 80s stuff. Like, you know, if people could just be born and they're well-fed, sheltered, and in harmony with the environment and the planet, and you and everybody gets the basic universal things, like you get shelter, food, electricity, and um, people are treated by by the system with dignity, basic dignity, and 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 um, there's a true sense of equality. Not like we have to do all this work to get to you know if that's over. Um, and we have to um, earn our equality. <laughs> yeah. And this is like this deep connection, deep connection to the whole, um, the divine in me, the divine in you, the divine in all, like for us to really feel it and live it and practice it every day. That's, that's sort of the dream for me. What about you? Okay, I'm going to answer this question, but as all the, the, the watchers know, I always forget to tell the guests that they get to ask Alexis a question they're unprepared for before the end. I mean, that I'm unprepared for. So we both get end up being unprepared until I remember ahead of time. So you get to ask me a question I'm unprepared for. Um, keep that going in the back of your mind while I am answering what a shared and inclusive future looks like for me. Um, so even though I am a creative, I spent 33 years of my life not knowing I was a creative. Hmm. So I thought that I, I was this highly analytical linear thinker. And it wasn't until I had this integrated experience of life like until I, I stopped being disassociated and and started feeling my feelings Bef um that weren't just intense feelings like so like trauma when you have that on whatever level you have it if you have it consistently you're like wired for intensity or numbness, or at least that was the way that I was wired. And so 
my analytical brain turns on when I think of a shared and inclusive future and that this whole society or this whole world has had this uh, system of traumatizing each other for survival. So it was start in now time with a global initiative to eradicate the effects of history's trauma including the dehumanization of the victimizer and the victimized. Meaning people would reintegrate their feeling and lived experience and gain and be taught tools to navigate those somatic responses. And it will be taught at every generational level so that we would learn how to get along with each other. And, but we will be allowed to have negative feelings. We will be taught how not to react to the negative feelings mm. until we're present to make a clear choice. That would be a part of society. But then the reason that I want all that healing is because it is personal. I, the more, so I had a spiritual awakening and I had the real, I started the journey of self-discovery that all the spiritual systems teach you to do. And I'm in understanding who I am as self, I have to see who I am in relation to society. Because the only way you understand yourself is in relationship to something else, whether it be relationship to spirit, relationship to your human experience, relationship to the people in your human experience and your family and your, you know, whatever it is, it's in relation to. Who am I in relation to that? Shout out to Esther Perel. Um, and so who I am in relation to society is oppressed. So then I needed to learn more about what oppression is like. And so I started teaching it. And then I, the, what I realized was how much oppression played out in the individual traumas I had experienced in that the oppression was a part of creating my victimizers. So a shared and inclusive future to wrap it up, heals, creates justice, equity and inclusion for both the victimized and the victimizer. Because I do not agree with becoming the thing that you hate as a remedy for safety. Mm -hmm. and a shared mm -hmm. and inclusive future it means that it is safe for we to be we and me to be me I love that thank you I think we should just like stand with ours together and yes. everybody else's visions and guess what we would have a shared and inclusive now yay <laughs> metaphysically we could just get people to really tune in on the knowing it's possible Reality would be like, boop, here mm -hmm. it is. Um, so we have about, say, six minutes left. I would like to give three of those minutes to the question and three of those minutes to, even though we're definitely going to have you back, Auntie Cheryl, because we got to talk about, like, being Black and being Asian and how, and, like, what comes up in between i've not had i told you i've not had any negative experiences with that i can think of with any one of asian descent hmm. but i know people who have and i hmm. do have biases that come to mind when i'm thinking of them hmm. and with my work with you and my exposure to your work and your community and the group uh, that you told me about with the asians for black lives asian americans for black lives I've learned more about like different things. And so we can't get too much into it, but I just want y'all to know Cheryl is a beast at explaining these things. Um, and so we're going to have Cheryl back, but give us like, if you could say three things that a black person should know that Asians have to deal with. The biggest thing is the, the model minority myth and the word myth is the operational word here. And this myth is, uh, it oppresses us because we end up being placed in a box where we absolutely have to behave in order to receive goodies. And 
this position is weaponized against my black friends. My, and so I, I um, this, this racial triangulation is a sick one. And so Asian liberation is highly, highly tied to black liberation. And so uh, being, I guess, accomplices to, to sort of dismantle this racial triangulation is, is, is close to my heart. It is close to mine too. And so of course I have to be a little bit quippy and this was actually a shower download. So it's a quip and a truth for me. What I think is the solution to all of this mess that we hear is if the world was to love a black woman. I like that. Like actively though, like choose to create the experience of love for a black woman. And mm -hmm. then I'm only, I'm a black woman. So I have my lens that I'm speaking from, but I believe that when I think of like the racial hierarchy and privilege hierarchy and things like that, a black or an indigenous may, but I'm, I'm a black woman. So I'm speaking for us. Um, but like love us like with action and allow us to have the experience of being loved. And you see the magnitude of our creativity. We'll take care of all of y'all. It's what we've been doing. It's who we are. So if you loved on us, we would love you back. And then the whole world be healed because the top will love the bottom and the bottom will love the top and everybody in between will be just sandwiched with love. And I think that that is a fun shine, tender heart, harmony, good luck, all the Care Bears. And we'll even love Grumpy Bear too because it's okay to be grumpy sometimes. Love it. Um, so then now, Auntie Cheryl, what is it that you're going to ask Alexis? Huh. So if there was a black woman who's also queer, um, that we need to love right away, who would that be? Oh man, all of them. Um, <laughs> right, like the one closest to you is my, like, that starts immediately, that starts close, it starts, it, whatever, sir, wherever you think to start loving, love them. Um, and if you don't know where to think, expose, Google it, be active in your allyship, uh, watch Paul, watch Queer Center TV, watch, watch Queer Center people, um, not queer centered people, queer people, right? <laughs> like, embrace it. Find, be curious. Leave with curiosity. And then be like, hmm, I'm getting to know you with the intention to love you. And you, the answer will emerge. Um, so who? All of them. How? Actively and authentically. And if you want to learn how to do that, you can sign up for my upcoming course, Actively Authentic Allyship. It is probably going to be in the last week of January or sometime in February. I'm working with my team to finalize the dates. But that's just how to love, like to take on, do your share of mental equipped labor of think about race from the Black perspective in society. But love all the Black women, the queer ones, the straight ones, and, and straight queer, I mean, straight, straight people love queer people too. Right, like black black people, if just because they black and queer don't mean they not black. And love all people, but love them too, because they can't divorce themselves from their blackness or their queerness. And so I don't know if that was the answer you was looking for. I don't have a specific one to love all, but find them, seek them out and love on them the way they want to be loved on. I love that. I have several in my life that I really love. My best friend is one. Queer, Black. Oh, Black and Asian. So oh, um, wonderful. Asian. Blasian. <laughs> um, so, well, then let's love on her. Yeah. What's her name? Her name is Anjanette Price, and she has she taught me how to do squats. Uh -huh. she's, a, she's a PT and a chiropractor. That's what's up. I am um, yeah. doing 50 squats a day challenge. I have not done any of my 50 yet today, but I'll get them in because it's day 17. I've done all the other ones. I can't like fail now. And <laughs> I've tried on some lingerie yesterday because I'm doing a boudoir shoot. 
And I was like, oh, hey, sexy. When I was looking in the mirror, I was talking to myself. Yay. Whoa, who is that? Um, <laughs> you can also love Alexis. Uh, and uh, you can also love Alexis. That's right. I am a Black woman you can love on. And I'm queer. And I listen, it's COVID-19. I need all the love I can get as soon as we get it free. All right. As soon as we let into the out, somebody better snatch me or I'm out in these streets. I just want to <laughs> let it be known. I am, oh, I'm overwhelmed with being stuck in the house. I know. But you know, you're inspiring me. I think for the next week, I'm just going to feature Black queer women on my Facebook posts. And the ones that I, my favorite love, the ones I love most, I'm just, just going to be on my Facebook page for a week. Oh, that's awesome. I do yeah. not have content space right now, but I want, may, I want to do that too. <laughs> You'll have to tell me when I should do it. Like when is the pro, when is the lunar new moon? Maybe I can celebrate that. Oh, I think it's February. Oh, it's coming up too. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Is it around February 8th? Do you know? Said day has some significance for me. I think it's the second week this year, but I'm not sure. I'll have to look it up. Well, maybe I can do that then. And then we can love on Asian women, Asian queer women. Yeah, I, I like that. Love that. That's awesome. Um, y'all keep me true to that because um, y'all, as you saw last episode, I enjoy cannabis and I have the full intention of wanting to do this, but I may forget. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Auntie Cheryl, one last thing. I know I'm, we've been talking a lot, it's been amazing, but what do you want to tell the people? If you have one thing to finish with, what do you want is the last thing you want them to hear from you? Um. Let's round up the, the this year with just some kindness. Oh my goodness. Um, also, the name of my microphone is Kamala. Dedicated to Kamala. Um, especially when she said, I'm speaking, I'm like, ha yes. yes. She's everybody's, she's every, all Asians love her, the auntie and her and all black people love the auntie and her. So everybody. it's in this microphone. Here's the thing. As much as these dynamics are like complex and nuanced, we all like, wait a minute, we in there, right? <laughs> like, yes. Either way, we in there. And if she thinks from both perspectives, to me, that's even doper or more mm -hmm. dope or however you say. You heard me, it's dope. Um, <laughs> so I love that and I love you. Thank you so much for being a guest on The Comfy Couch. You are welcome back. And I really think that we had a wonderful discussion and I want to have more because we did not talk about what we intended to talk about so much. <laughs> you got distracted. But thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I feel really honored. So, well, thank you. You have honored us with your presence. Bye, y'all. See you next week. Bye-bye.